Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ali Bahadur Zaybek and I work as a team lead solutions architect at Ververica. Uh, and yes, I want to share today and on how one can implement an anomaly detection system series data uh, using Apache Flink. So let's set our agenda first and we will start with some background information and explore some motivation on why this, why such, such a system is needed. We will dive into the theory of some anomalies and finally go through some implementation details. And hopefully we will have some time to have the Q&A. So as a background, uh, what is Apache Flink, right? Uh, I guess I owe Martin, the previous speaker, a thank you because he gave a quite good information about what Apache Flink is. So in a nutshell, it's a framework and a distributed processing engine for stateful computations uh, over unbounded and bounded data streams. And who is Ververica? So this is the company founded by the original creators of Apache Flink. Since 2014, it has been working uh, related to the products and services for Apache Flink and also the organizer of the Flink Forward that will happen in Seattle this year. Okay, so what is our motivation? Why do we need such a system, or why do we need to detect, detect anomalies on time series data to begin with, right? For that, let's take a step back and try to understand uh, the current modern uh, architectures that people are deploying their backend services, right? So nowadays, everything seems to be a microservice. You can either do SOAP, REST, gRPC, GraphQL, pick your favorite one. And everything comes with a design pattern. There is a service registry, API gateway, event-driven, or CQRS, right? And finally, everything in a container. So either you can run it in Apache Mesos, Kubernetes, or Docker Swarm. So still, what I'm trying to say is, Nowadays, when you are building such a system, things, get, things can get quite complicated quite easily. Right, let's see a high level overview of some architecture, right? Let's say we have some service A that depends on service B, which communicates to service C and go, goes on, right? And when it, everything is going well, uh, all the load is distributed fairly among these instances of the services, right? But what happens uh, in the case of a failure, right? Let's say we have service A and service B up for all their instances, but let's say the instance one of the service C goes down, and suddenly all of the load goes to the second instance of the service C. Right? This is more of like a sudden spike that increases the number of incoming requests. But does it mean like every increase means an anomaly or something we need to detect? Uh, not necessarily. Maybe a change in our uh, seasonal uh, users resulted in all the traffic to increase or maybe double. So this is something we don't want to consider as an anomaly. Right now, what we have done is actually we have kind of set up a couple of requirements and expectations for what it to be an anomaly. So let's put some name on it, right? So someone anomaly, we want to first detect the anomalies that we define as abrupt transient. So what does it mean is if we are counting the number of incoming requests per second to a service, right, an abrupt transient change is something that happens quite suddenly, but uh, heals it itself. Moving forward, there is also abrupt distrib distributional shift, where there is a sudden change, such as sudden increase, but this goes for a while and then goes back to its normal state. Again, this is considered as abrupt, 
shift, and we also want to detect this as an anomaly. And if you go back to what the normal, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, uh, gradual distributional shift looked like, let's say a seasonal shift, this is some scenario we don't want to uh, consider as an anomaly. This doesn't mean we don't want to detect or understand this, but just that we don't want to get some sort of alerting. And more on anomaly detection, what we have as a constraint is, since we are pro processing time series data in a streaming manner, that means there is no label training data. And that means also we want to alert on abrupt transient changes while we quickly adjust to the change and not alert on gradual shifts. So going more on the anomaly detection of the streaming, we only have a single pass at the data. What does it mean is for each data, we cannot, like for each event, we cannot go to the history and recalculate any of the logic. Hence, we also need minimal storage because streaming systems, even though they can run with high level of memory, the storage capabilities are not free. Also, to be able to perform well, uh, our computation needs to be uh, low complexity. So all of these requirements results in a single behavioral model to be kept in memory, continuously updated, where we define anomaly as we have an actual value and an expected value for each event, and where we define the anomaly at the result of this computation exceeds some threshold. So, so far all of these have been a little abstract, right? So what we have as a current value, what we have as actual value. So this calculation is even just, yeah, get the absolute and compare it, the percentage. So one of the algorithms that can actually tell us what to expect for the next value, given all the previous values, simply is a moving average. Right, what this gives us is we just calculate the expected value as the moving average of all the previous values. So this is the most simplest form, but what it does is for each new event, this gives the same effect for all the previous events. So what does it mean is if I get a new event that has the same cofactor or the same effect value, as all the previous events. This is, of course, something we don't want. And as an addition, there was an introduction of exponentially weighted moving average. This time, instead of calculating all the moving averages, uh, we simply add a coefficient where we can decide how much of the new events to affect the overall expected value, right? This here is coefficient called as A, and this time we are multiplying it with the previous expected value, and also adding it with the one minus of this coefficient with the actual value. So here it defines as like how much the new value should affect the overall internal model. Yet this also has some drawbacks, as even though the new events that are making a change to our internal model has a good effect, it is really hard to go back to a previous state. So for this reason, what we do is to introduce some probabilistic uh, variable where we continuously also calculate uh, this probabilistic value and also add this as a cofactor to our previous uh, formula. If you have a look at here, 
if you take this B, which is the new parameter, which is also the cofactor, that how much this probability should take into effect, right? What we are doing is actually we are taking our previous exponentially weighted moving average and we are introducing some randomness. And this time we also add a cofactor B to be able to tune how much randomness we want to introduce, right? Basically, if you take B as one here, that one minus, uh, sorry, if you, yeah, take B as one, and this is going basically same as the exponentially weighted moving average. So more on anomaly detection, uh, this is based on one academic paper that was previously published in 2012, where you can also find further information of how to understand what an anomaly is and further drawbacks. But here we are going to go into the actual project where this is implemented, so where we can play with those parameters and actually see how it behaves and how it changes the detected anomalies. So you remember we had like uh, some source connectors and sync connectors and also process functions. So our main pipeline is actually one network traffic aggregate here that is keyed by the target IP, counting the number of incoming requests per second in the first definition of uh, pipeline, and then Again, keying it by the IP, but this time we are passing our own custom process function implementation. And basically, this is the process function implementation that is taking the time series data as input. And finally, thanks to Apache Flink's uh, side output functionality, we can output uh, both the anomalies and network traffic aggregates, and yeah, and the predictions, like what are the internal model tells us the next value should look like in different outputs. So if you look at this as an overall, this is how our pipeline will look like. And some more on the implementation, within our process element, so we are using the data stream API of Apache Flink for the ones that are not familiar with it. The core method is the process element which is called for each event that are consumed in the data stream. So we are having a network traffic aggregate and first we are calling two methods, detect and predict. And finally, one key aspect of developing Flink applications is to test it. So we are going to have a test use case where we run the pipeline and furthermore generate some reports. Additionally, uh, I prepared some simple website, kind of HTML website, where we can visualize the results, both for the actual data aggregations, which you can see here, the red dots which thinks, which our program thinks is an anomaly, and also the dotted green line, which represents the internal behavioral model and how it adapts based on the changes. So now I will be switching into my IntelliJ and hopefully you can see the same code that was visible on the slides. But where the magic happens, let's say, is this process function implementation. So these alpha, beta values are the ones that are coming from the formula, where the threshold percentage is the one that we define as when to consider something as an anomaly. So we are just taking the difference of the percentage of the actual value and expected value and comparing it threshold percentage. 
So one key thing to consider here is all of those formulas that I was mentioning, they all rely on previous outputs, right? They are kind of recursive. So since we don't have any labeled data here, we still need to have, let's say, bootstrap or training uh, phase that needs to happen initially, right? We need to give some initial values and we need to say, okay, to our program, don't think something is an anomaly for this amount of time. So our internal model sort of adapts to what the actual world looks like. And afterwards, uh, yeah, it will be continuing to think what is an anomaly or not. So for the ones, again, that are not familiar with Apache Flink or who already knows it, what, we, what I mentioned initially about what Apache Flink is, it provides stateful computations. Here, what you are seeing are basically the state values that were coming up from the formula. Why do we need this state? For each event, right, we need to have a way to remember what was it previously. Hence, we are keeping it in the Apache Flink value state. And also, we need to keep a state, right, like not just following the formula, but we need to decide, okay, if we are already in alert state, right, and what are the, let's say, iterations that we are going over training count. So these are the Flink state values that I am keeping here in order to run this pipeline. And this is the test bed, let's say, uh, where you run the pipeline and the generate report. This repository is available on GitHub, so it will also be on the slide how to access it. But again, I also want to emphasize on how this is structured. Like, from my perspective, one good part of this is it has a quite good data generator. For each streaming application, one of the hardest part is to, like while testing locally, is to replicate some sort of real life scenarios, right? Here we have something called like a normal scenario, and then we have an abrupt increase definition, which now follows by abrupt decrease, right? So what it will look like is actually like a sudden spike, right? So we had an increase and decrease. And for a while we are going normal, and then we again have an increase, which goes for normal, and normal means, normal doesn't mean linear here, but again, it's just somehow fluctuating. And finally, it has a decrease. And if you recall, this translates into the second anomaly type we were talking about, abrupt distributional change. And finally, yeah, we have a normal distribution. So this is the source data generator. And finally, if I just run this test, what it will do is to go and run that pipeline with the input value and three different things. You see one good part of the Flink's connector ecosystem and how its APIs are designed, you can basically pass different things based on your local test or going into production. So now what I am passing are simple sync functions that are, yeah, about to be, like that are about to be deprecated, I guess, which are just adding into some local list. And when I run this test, what it's, does to the outside world is to generate this JSON file. So this is the website I was talking about. And if I come here, I basically, uh, yeah, this is, okay. Yeah, 
This looks very similar to what I had in the screenshot, right? Initially, we have some training phase. That's why for this many counts, our internal model is having problems to adapt to the real world. And just after the training count is finished, it is considered as an anomaly. Or afterwards, we have some sudden spike. And we have, yeah, some another anomaly here. And finally, for the abrupt distributional change, we detect both going up and down, right? Because our model internally quickly adapts to this new distribution. So, so far so good, right? But here what I want to test is to come to to come back to my implementation, uh, yep, and play a little with those alpha beta values, right? So if you recall, if you set beta to zero, this time it was translating into what we described as exponentially weighted moving average. So we basically eliminate the probabilistic approach. We are eliminating the randomness. So in that case, how it will translate into our tests. So let's run it and see it. Yep, and hopefully this will reload itself. Yeah, first of all, what we don't see as a change is of course during the training phase, we have another anomaly and for the spike, we have one anomaly. But if you recall what was the green dotted lines looking like in the previous approach where we didn't change the beta value, it was following a lot more similarly and a lot closer to the real world. So even here we can see that just changing from probabilistic approach to non-probabilistic approach, our internal model is having troubles to adapt to the sudden changes. It is still trying to adapt, so there is a change, but it is a lot further away what was compared to the previous one. And furthermore, since this internal model now is having, let's say, troubles into adapting it quickly, what it results is in an increase in the number of anomalies, right? Because if it cannot adapt to what is actually going on in the outside world, then it will start thinking there are more anomalies happening. And that is why if you look back into our previous abrupt distributional change, even though our previous model, just after the initial anomaly detected, it was adapting quickly, yet now it is taking more time, it is a more gradual line to adapt to this change, so it is still producing some anomalies detected initially for this distributional shift. The same logic applies to when it goes back to the, let's say, previous state, or now it's a new anomaly state. And just end is just end of data, so that is mostly noise in the local test. So let's say we want to now return this. Right, and now let's see, let's say we want to play with alpha. So how we described alpha was, this was the cofactor that was defining how much the new values should affect the current internal model, right? Basically, actually the one minus of it. So now it is like 0, 8 to 5. Maybe it is good to just run the test initially. and yeah, have a more controlled environment. This should, yeah, refresh itself as soon as it is finished with the new data. 
And yeah, like you see one thing maybe interesting here, even though we reverted back the parameters into previous values, even though there is a probabilistic, like just because there is a probabilistic approach, we don't get the same exact anomalies every time, right? I am not changing the generated data because like that generator is still the same, but now we have one internal, like one anomaly that is part of the new shift. Okay, so what was I saying is let's play with alpha and let's try to decrease it. Okay. And now my local setup is using something called a mini cluster, just some side information, which is a way to run your Apache Flink pipelines locally in a single core, like a single uh, task manager and job manager in the same JVM environment. Right, and what we see here now, right, our model is actually getting a lot closer to what the actual values are. Basically, I mean, we are not even able to see the green lights because of the original uh, black values. So, is it a good thing, is it a bad thing? Of course, it depends on your use case. These are some analytics that needs to be done in offline and updated accordingly because what should mean an anomaly for you and what should don't mean, totally up to your business use case, right? Even though we don't have labeled data in real time in the online training, we still have an option to actually update the alpha, beta, and the other threshold based on some offline analysis and based on some seasonal values, right? So my model is basically now exactly the same as what the history of the data is. So maybe this is also something that I don't want to act like. So the bottom line here is, okay, maybe like, yeah, I guess you all got the idea, so I will not be playing with the threshold percentage Right? If I just change the percentage, it will be easier or harder to detect the change as an anomaly. But what will not change is the green line or the yeah, green line to black line ratio. So bottom line here is this is a good starting point to have an online anomaly detection system on time series data. Is it like a perfect system? No. How you can improve it is to coordinate with, let's say, your data science team to have offline analysis with some previously actually labeled data to detect on what these alpha, beta, and threshold values should look like, let's say, based on some other external or business requirements. For example, it is, yeah, like uh, Black Friday and you want to change it, etc. And yeah, finally, you can have a complete unified online and offline anomaly detection system. And for sure, you can build on top of the algorithms to make it more smarter and smarter. So this was the implementation part. And yeah, I hope it was not too boring to follow, but the implementation itself is available on GitHub. I suggest you yeah, have a look if it took your attention. And I guess we have 15 minutes left, so I will be super happy to have your questions. And thank you very much, and don't forget to step uh, stop by our booth at 202 and we also have a Ververica October Fest in between 4 to 6 p.m. today in the cafeteria. So, yeah, I guess that's all from me. Thank you very much.